Today I am going to be presenting about GLP-1 agonist as a potential treatment for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or NAFLD. I wanted to thank my content expert Josh Weigel for helping me with developing this presentation. So the objectives for the presentation today are to explain the pathophysiology and treatment of NAFLD, identify relevant studies and active clinical trials evaluating the use of GLP-1 agonists in the treatment of NAFLD, and discuss the future outlook for screening and treatment of NAFLD. So I want to start by discussing what is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, or NAFLD. It is a continuum of liver disease characterized by excessive hepatic fat deposits. As you can see on the diagram from the right, you start with your normal liver, and as you have more fat and fat infiltration in the liver, you get into the steatosis stage um, that can start to cause some inflammation and necrosis of cells leading to hepatitis, steatohepatitis hepatitis to be specific, and that can eventually lead to fibrosis, scarring, and cirrhosis. The Prevalence in the United States is estimated to be 33% and rising, and it is now the second leading cause of liver transplant for UW. Risk factors for NAFLD include obesity, type 2 diabetes, dyslipidemia, and other metabolic syndromes. In terms of pathophysiology and treatment, it is caused by an excessive accumulation of toxic lipids in the liver, um, causes impaired synthesis and secretion of VLDL cholesterol. And VLDL cholesterol is made up of 50% triglycerides, which accumulate in the liver instead of circulating and kind of build up that toxicity in the liver. Insulin resistance is also believed to play a role. Um, the pathology isn't super well understood. In terms of treatment, um, it's mostly through non-pharmacological methods, including diet modifications, kind of decreasing cholesterol, triglycerides, and saturated fat, exercise, and weight loss. And then um, for pharmacological options, they are relatively limited. Vitamin E and pioglitazone have shown modest evidence of benefit, but there's not, since it's poorly understood. Uh, there's not very many therapeutic targets. Um, insulin resistance is a promising option, given that there's a lot of established medications for that. So in order to classify steatosis, an important scoring tool is the NAFLD activity score, or NAS. Uh, and there's different buckets of criteria for this um, and it goes on a scale from zero to eight with eight being the most severe and these are all the potentially reversible features of NAFLD and NASH with hepatocellular ballooning being the defining criteria for NASH or steatohepatitis specifically and then there's also a scale to classify fibrosis um, going from no fibrosis to cirrhosis. And this has a stronger correlation with liver-related death. And the scarring and fibrosis aren't as easily reversible as the steatosis. So GLP-1 agonists, we know these medications as a treatment option for diabetes as well as for weight loss. And a meta-analysis that was completed kind of looked at some of the liver outcomes, and it showed a significant decrease in the percentage of liver fat content with a mean weighted difference of negative 3.92%. This one included seven studies with um, exenatide, liraglutide, dulaglutide, and semaglutide. And then in the top figure, you can see the odds ratio for NASH resolution, which included four different studies with liraglutide and semaglutide. Um, and this was statistically significant 
And then the bottom shows non-significant improvement in fibrosis stage. It is very close to being statistically significant with the lower bound of the odds ratio being 0.98. So it's possible that with a little bit more robust data, um, either like a larger sample size or studies over a longer period of time, that we may see some benefit in fibrosis improvement. So GLP-1 agonists, uh, there's tons of data in patients with diabetes that have shown some benefits for hepatic steatosis. The mechanism of action of GLP-1 agonists, they delay gastric emptying and they suppress appetite, kind of helping with weight loss and insulin resistance. The mechanism in the liver is not super well understood, but they do improve insulin resistance. They kind of decrease de novo lipogenesis and they increase beta oxidation, oxidation which utilizes some of those free fatty acids that are built up in the liver. Overall, it appears that the insulin resistance is the most important piece in terms of NAFOLD. So now I wanted to go into a couple of trials that studied GLP-1 agonists for NAFOLD specifically. So the first one is the LEAN trial. You can see the inclusion criteria. Importantly, it included patients with and without diabetes uh, who had biopsy-confirmed NASH. And the intervention group was subcutaneous glutide daily versus placebo. Looking at the primary outcome, it was statistically significant for resolution of NASH without worsening of fibrosis at week 48. And secondary outcomes, it did significantly improve the hepatocyte ballooning, as we would expect, given that that's a defining criteria for NASH, as well as theatosis. However, it did not significantly improve lobular inflammation, the NAFOLD activity score, or fibrosis. Uh, so a couple of limitations with this trial are the small sample size. It was a total N of 52. It also used a per protocol analysis with a week 48 biopsy needing to be read to be included in the data. And then the sh overall short duration being only 48 weeks. The next trial I wanna go through is the phase two semaglutide trial. This one had very similar inclusion and exclusion criteria. The intervention was three different doses of semaglutide versus placebo. And for the primary outcome, resolution of NASH without worsening of fibrosis, this one at week 72, all three arms were statistically significant, and the absolute risk difference for the 0.4 milligram arm was 59% with resolution of NASH versus 17% in placebo. And then looking at the secondary outcome of improvement in fibrosis without worsening of NASH, this was not statistically significant. There was a 10% absolute risk difference between the 0.4 milligram and placebo. This one had an N of 230 for the primary analysis and 320 for the secondary. The secondary analysis did include some patients with fibrosis stage one. And then for limitations of this trial, short duration would be the big one. So kind of looking at some of the gaps with these trials, I think it's important to see some more long-term given that NAFOLD is a chronic disease. So now looking at some ongoing trials, the first one is the ESSENCE trial, which is a phase three weekly semaglutide versus placebo. Uh, the goal is to enroll 1,200 participants. It has a very similar inclusion and exclusion criteria to the previous trials. And for its endpoints, it's looking at the 72-week NASH resolution and fibrosis improvement, as well as the 240-week liver-related clinical events. So these clinical events would include progression to cirrhosis, mortality, a MELD score greater than 15, 
liver transplant or any hepatic decompensation leading to hospitalization. I think this trial will really be beneficial to kind of show what the long-term benefits of a GLP-1 are for NAFOLD and NASH. And then the second trial is a uh, phase 2B3 trial with daily cotidutide, which is another GLP-1 agonist. Um, this one is very similar to the previous trials that have been published, although it does have a goal of a larger participant load of 1,860, and it's going to look at 48 and 84 week endpoints for NASH resolution and fibrosis. So what does this data really mean for GLP-1 agonists in NAFOLD? It's a promising treatment option to prevent progression to chronic liver disease. However, the question still remains on who should we use this in and how to screen patients. So I just wanted to leave a little bit of time here for people to either put answers in the chat or feel free to unmute just um, different risk factors in patients that you would consider screening them if possible for potentially adding on a GLP-1 agonist. All right, just in the interest of time. Um, so I think uh, important risk factors that might make you wanna screen someone would be some of those conditions that put you at risk for it, including obesity, type two diabetes, dyslipidemia, and uh, metabolic syndrome. Uh, the other important thing would be how do we monitor progression? So, Biopsy is the gold standard in diagnosis. However, um, it can be difficult to use being that it's an invasive technique. It's also dangerous with um, risks for complications. It's expensive with costs generally being between $1,500 to $4,000. It's also difficult to access. Uh, you have to get an appointment with a hepatologist and then um, also schedule the biopsy. And then sampling variability can lead to misdiagnosis. They take a very small sample of the liver and theatosis and fibrosis may not affect the liver unif uniformly. So you may not get an accurate picture of overall liver health. So I just wanted to end by discussing a potential future option to screen for theatosis and NAFOLD and get someone started on treatment early before it progresses to the point where they're having some of the complications or requiring a liver transplant. So the FibroScan is a non-invasive ultrasound technology to measure liver health. It's a probe that's placed against the skin between the ribs and it takes a sample size that is approximately 100 times that of a normal biopsy. It measures two different numbers. The first one is the liver stiffness me measurement, which is the same as that VCTE value in the figure on the right. And this measures the shear wave speed as it propagates through liver tissue and correlates with the degree of fibrosis. And then the second one, the controlled attenuation parameter calculates the attenuation of the ultrasound signal, which correlates with the degree of steatosis. However, these numbers are kind of difficult to interpret, and it's hard to say based on these whether we should start someone on treatment or not. So there's been a lot of different algorithms created to um, put these numbers into context. One that I just wanted to present that sounds particularly promising is the FAST score, which uses the LSM, CAP, as well as your ASP lab value to calculate a score. 
and it's been externally value, validated with rule in and rule out cutoffs for NASH, a na NAFLD activity score greater than or equal to four and fibrosis stage greater than or equal to two. And you can see the negative predictive value for the rule out cutoff is 0 0.85 and 0 0.94 on external validation. So that would be the probability that a negative test is a true negative. And then the positive predictive value for the rule in would be 0.83 and 0.69 on external validation. So I just think that this would be a really useful option to potentially, excuse me, uh, to potentially screen patients without having to do a biopsy and get them started on a GLP-1 agonist or potentially other medications to help with preventing NASH progression and NAFLD progression to the point where they're having more serious complications. Um, now I just wanted to leave some time for questions. And if there are no questions, we can move on to the next presentation. 